Hi there, I made a very long video but I'll replace it to one, uh, this one that's a bit shorter. I think that uh, what the point was of my previous video, and I appreciate the views on it, uh, is that uh, well, if you have a market that is not able to deliver the silver that you have uh, bought in it, or that you uh, are, are holding there, then uh, how good a market is it and how valuable is that contract that you own? So it would really mean a, a big quality of a market to be able to deliver promptly uh, directly uh, and in all circumstances because the big problem of course is that when you get a run on silver or on gold then uh, and you're in the COMEX or in London then uh, well you're shit out of luck probably you, you, you hold a lottery ticket and you're not sure what you're going to get somebody remarked that it's well the same because you'll get the currency you get dollars or pounds I guess uh, if they cannot deliver but <laughs> that the whole point of, uh, of holding metals is that you have something that you can uh, use everywhere, that it's liquid everywhere. Dollars are not liquid and will not be liquid everywhere at all times. They will be valueless, uh, you know, at least, uh, you know, in, an <laughs> in another hundred years or something. For sure. That's just out of, uh, that's just evident. And you don't want that. So a market uh, has a value uh, dependent on whether it's able to deliver it. But in the first place, you, you, had, you had money. You, you bought metals, you went to a market because it's safe. But you can also keep the metals at home in, a, in your own uh, lock and key and whatever storage. And then trade online and then deliver once a contract is settled. Yeah. That, that could also be the case. Everybody could be on their own trading silver and gold and, and palladium and all that stuff. But uh, <laughs> we did <laughs> people don't do that because they want to be secure and they want to make sure that the silver is always there. Uh, that it's not being stolen, but also, of course, that they can access it. So I guess a market that can prove it is uh, it is able to always deliver, and that basically takes that as a as a basically a motto, uh, and could set up shop next to the COMEX, will see that it's quickly uh, depleting the COMEX of real metal, because it would it's, it's like it is like a lottery. If you buy a, a COMEX contract or a London contract and you ask for delivery of the metals, and you actually get them, then you basically won the lottery, because it's a chance one in a hundred that you'll get it. <laughs> and that should be a nice game. And there should, so there should be fractional, uh, of not fractional, but fragmented prices of silver. It's completely uh, a different topic, uh, so fractional price of silver, and I guess you could even make up some kind of uh, silver uh, store default swap or something like that, maybe Janet Tavakoli can uh, can, uh, can shine her light on that, uh, that you basically make a contract which says that, uh, that there's some kind of penalty, some kind of mechanism where you leverage uh, the inability uh, of, of, a, of a market to actually deliver the, deliver the metals, which you then use, uh, which, which then basically uh, uh, kind of encapsulate the silver. So you create a contract that, that both has uh, the promise to deliver uh, bullion and also has an extra uh, uh, mechanism to ensure against non-delivery of the bullion. I'm not sure whether that uh, it, <laughs> it can probably work. You can make everything up in the financial industry, and these things uh, should then trade very low price on the COMEX. And if they trade at a high price, then you immediately see, hey, here's the risk on the COMEX. It's not a good market. You should get the hell out of there. Uh, another thing that I, I found out is that I was looking into the productivity of organic farming and basically it's just as productive, if not pr more productive, than intensive farming. But I came across a quote by uh, the CEO of Monsanto, you know, uh, of all people, and saying that uh, it's clearly not sustainable, intensive farming. It's clearly a dead-end road. Uh, that's not what he literally says. But he says, well, it hasn't le uh, led to self-sustenance in, uh, in Africa. It... Uh, it, 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 it kills the soil, it depletes it, it, it makes it more saline because of the irrigation, etc., etc., all kinds of trouble. He knows it. You know, that's just something to, that should sink in to the minds of, 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 of pro technological advance and bio industry uh, people. That the, the, the CEO of the company that is, let's say, the foremost promoter of uh, a method of farming that is high-tech, uh, bioengineers and all this stuff with all kinds of fertilizer and petrochemical uh, inputs, knows that it is unsustainable and knows that it renders the, oil, uh, the earth 
uh, lethal basically because it's dead you know you are if you are in a fertile land where everything grows on its own then you you have some kind of continuity there if you are in a, an environment where everything is dependent on irrigation and fertilization and chemicals and otherwise it is dead it's completely there uh, not there anymore all the seeds are terminator seeds so the next generation doesn't really occur you know who who needs bees if you have terminator seeds uh, crazy no then you're basically uh, you're like a diver you have a you have a tank of oxygen and you're just hoping that it doesn't run out too soon so you can still have some fun it's it's a suicidal mission that you're on and this guy the ceo of monsanto knows that and openly says it as well how can you have somebody uh, promote a method of painting yourself into a corner in terms of your food supply which in some countries really means uh, dire consequences um, <laughs> And uh, another depressing uh, news uh, item is that uh, uh, people are trying to explain the rise of jellyfish around, around the world. And, uh, and I was reading an article of, of the Green Prophet of a person that I thought, well, might be an interesting woman to have a, a contribution to climate uh, babes, my other websites with women that write about climate change. <laughs> As he writes, well, it's uh, probably uh, the increased salinity because of desalination plants that causes the rise in jellyfish yeah <laughs> anyway <laughs> I guess uh, but it's true you know if you if you remove most fish species from the oceans uh, by fishing for them and by basically turning the chemical uh, makeup of the oceans into something in which they cannot really reproduce anymore and I mean almost all oceanic species have a problem there uh, then, uh, and then you're going to be stuck with a few species that can survive in those circumstances or are so proliferate and so uh, have such a rapid turnover genetically that they can adapt uh, and there might be physical limits I guess that's the most scary part of it there might be a physical limit to uh, to, pro to procreation let's say just the whole chemical process of it that doesn't really have to be because if let's say humans would uh, wear spacesuits at all times uh, uh, and, and uh, have spaceships then they can procreate anywhere and I guess nature has an ability to uh, to, to, to devise the same type of encapsulations <coughs> but really this time in this evolutionary uh, reset that we're facing uh, because that's what it is we're gonna lose almost all species uh, we, we give them extremely little time to adapt you know in the in the previous one the end permian extinction which had exactly the same type of circumstances rapid climate change uh, but also lots of chemical pollution you had a couple of thousand years uh, so i guess a couple of thousand generations uh, for species to grow smaller because the food supply became less abundant <coughs> or simply adapt new uh, well basically not adapt but basically have a variety in their population so that some of them survived in the new har harsher circumstances and let's say the miracle species that survived were of course uh, the, the, the mammals and the reptiles uh, some kinds of trees and plants not very much but the baobab tree for instance very weird one they survived and maybe being very small maybe, uh, maybe in some cave somewhere for a couple of thousand years, you know, we don't give it, the, we don't don't give the environment that time this time. And who knows what type of toxic environment will will, will come come about uh, after uh, all life has disappeared. You know, one of the elements of the Permian extinction, uh, which is also occurring right now, is that there is increased rainfall, uh, which causes uh, uh, the washing away of nutrient-rich uh, topsoil, which is happening which then washes into the ocean and there it becomes it starts to rot and it rots for a while using oxygen because there's oxygen in the ocean uh, and then it creates carbon dioxide and methane and all that stuff um, and then after a while when the oxygen is depleted which happens which you, because you have lots of dead zones that are growing you get different types of bacteria that start to work on that uh, organic material and they produce uh, 
well, the toxic fumes. No, that's exactly the same scenario as was happening in the end Permian, and we know that because we can see a sediment layer which is black because of the carbon uh, or uh, the carbon organisms in it. So basically, what happened was after that, uh, af after the cli rapid climate change, the oceans became a big swamp and basically full of life, uh, of algae life. So not like say advanced big life forms, but algae that could. Uh, process those uh, that could eat those organic materials and turn it into something else and live of it in doing that but uh, the problem with it was that they're producing toxic fumes and just to uh, repeat uh, there was a, a case in France where you had some algae uh, washed up on the beach and there was a guy riding a horse, a horse there and the horse stuck his nose into the algae and was dead immediately just instantly and uh, and the guy fell off his horse, of course, and he was dragged to the shore, and he was just barely uh, barely saved. We're talking about those kind of algae. You also have them for the coast of Namibia and uh, those kind of African lands where the water is really warm and and deoxygenated, and uh, but there's organic mat material in it, and that simply means that you shouldn't go to the beach. You can't swim, uh, and it's it's also I guess interesting because these bacteria algae. They simply, well, whatever works, they do. So uh, some of them, uh, uh, sp specifically the benthic one, the ones that live on the bottom, they produce all kinds of toxic uh, uh, substances. Why? Well, because you know there is a, it's a nitrogen depleted uh, environment, for instance. So they don't have enough nitrogen. Comes a fish along, uh, they poison the fish basically. Fish falls down, rots, and releases the nitrogen which they need. So of course they have all. <laughs> All the all the bacteria and algae that were toxic, and uh, through that method uh, increased the nutrient uh, supply in their environment because they killed and everything that uh, oh they stayed they are around they're in our environment because they, they survived. And there's a story about a, a researcher uh, that was uh, let's say these these algae blooms he was researching it, and he basically fell off his pontoon and uh, well you get eaten by them. So that's uh, let's say that's just a futuristic uh, look at the natural envir environment. I guess uh, the best thing that the U.S. could U.S. people could do, one of the best things, is simply uh, make a citizens arrest of every uh, anthropogenic global warming denier, any uh, warmonger, anybody that is for oil. Just make a citizens arrest because these people are are basically committing uh, uh, human rights crimes and you simply should accuse them of that put them in uh, in uh, <laughs> you have to do something you know why not why not you know, take uh, take uh, 400 concerned citizens uh, for the future go to Fox News and capture everybody that comes out of that building don't hurt anybody but they have to tell you have to stick to the facts because they're making they're creating an ignorant mob that will uh, ultimately hurt the people that are well informed and I think it should be uh, committed, considered a crime you know it is a, considered a crime to to stir up a riot and say well we have to uh, kill those motherfuckers oh okay I'm not, a, I'm not for that but it should equally uh, be considered a crime saying well you know you can run your car over a cliff it's not a problem, and we should all have cars and run off cliffs. And you, and you, you, you know, it's just some people don't know how to take off with their cars once they are over the cliffs. They don't know how to fly, but cars can fly. You should try. You know, people that say those kind of things are that should be a criminal act as well. It's the inducement of uh, of reckless behavior. Maybe there's a <laughs> maybe there's a statute for that or some kind of law against inciting. Uh, self-damaging behavior or reckless behavior and you can if, if that's the case then you can wrap up all kinds of advertis advertisement marketing for bad products whole industries it should happen and, and pretty soon because you know otherwise it's just going to be uh, one calamity uh, after another in the next uh, 50 years or so uh, 